This episode of the podcast has been brought to you by Sweet Cheetah Publicity. Sweet Cheetah is an inclusive, socially conscious PR collective that puts their money where their mouth is. They have a current roster of bands that reads like a greatest hits anthology. Brainiac, Catholic School, Jawbox, The New Amsterdams, Oceans in the Sky. I mean, the list goes on and on. They also do PR for record labels such as A La Carte, Arctic Rodeo, Steadfast, Rad Girlfriend, and so many more. How do they pay it forward? How do they put their money where their mouth is? By generating thousands of dollars in annual charitable donations to the likes of Women in Vinyl, Coalition of Communities of Color, the NAACP Legal Defense Fund, and many, many more. The man has the receipts. I've seen them. It is real. The artists, labels, and podcasts Sweet Cheetah works with are curated with an eye on working primarily with friends. You could find Sweet Cheetah on all of the social media platforms, be it Instagram, Twitter, Facebook. Just look for Sweet Cheetah PR and they will be there. He's been Tim. I've been Peter. And Sweet Cheetah has been beautiful. Welcome to another edition of the Book of Very, Very Bad Things podcast. I'm your host, Peter, and I am still here. Tonight is our record release show for Mensa Death Squad. Mensa Death Squad is Brandon Phillips from the ska punk legends, The Gadgets. After The Gadgets, they were The Architects. And then Brandon went into Brandon Phillips and the Condition, Other Americans. He played with all sorts of sounds throughout his career. Ska punk, straight rock and roll, all the way to the synth-inflected dark wave pop that is Mensa Death Squad. The new record, Personal Book of Spells, is available everywhere. If you head on over to Bandcamp right now and type in Mensa Death Squad, you can order the digital version of this album. Go to Apple Music, go to Spotify, go to Amazon. It's there. It's ready to go. I've already heard the entirety of this record, and I can tell you with a great degree of certainty that it is the best record he has ever written. My personal opinion. I'd be remiss not to mention to you that I would love it very much if you would go to wherever you're listening to this right now, go to the website and like, rate, review, subscribe. And if you're really into it, head on over to my socials where you can subscribe on a monetary level. When doing so, on a monthly or yearly level, you will get a copy of our compilation record. You will get one episode a month that no one else can hear except for those who subscribe. And eventually, you'll be able to gain access to a members-only shop. There will be t-shirts, hoodies. You name it. Sky's the limit, right? If you really want to affect some change for this show, if you're a big fan, if you really love what I'm doing, head over to my socials, especially on Instagram or Facebook, and share my content. If I make a post, share it up. Your cosign means the world, and word of mouth makes or breaks every single business a little caveat this conversation took place while Brandon was en route to his plane ride I don't want to push this any further than I already have 
So, I present to you Brandon Phillips, Mensa Death Squad, on the book, A Very, Very Bad Things Podcast. Uh, No, listen, I, I wish I could have gotten on sooner, but my son needed bathing and food and, you know, all of the basic necessities. Understandable. So you're uh, you're on the cusp of uh, catching catching a flight somewhere in the midst of all this. Is that yeah. Right? Wow. <laughs> Excuse me. I'm gonna grab my earpiece just because it's the witching hour when everybody decides to uh, demonstrate their custom exhausts on my street. So. Yeah. <laughs> I always found it interesting that uh, people soup up their cars to sound like there's a a, a leak in the header of their exhaust system. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I want this to sound like it's broken. Okay. Yeah. That, that, very reminiscent of the late 80s, early 90s, high school years of, of, of this gentleman. Uh, everyone around me had like Dodge Omnis that had, uh, you know, really intricate like speaker systems and glass packs and everything but the car was just still a piece of garbage <laughs> yep yep there was an omni in my family it was not uh it was not souped up in any way but there was an omni in the family for sure <laughs> it was referred so, to as the omni like to rhyme with hominy yeah yeah it was the omni the omni that the omni yeah that sounds like it's the only way you should actually bring that forth it's way funnier like god almighty yeah and and you're from the midwest correct yes i am yeah that's uh there's there's something about the way we all sort of uh compose words in the midwest that flies in the face of the way the queen's english was intended yes uh the colloquialism of it all it's it's fascinating and disgusting all at the same time. <laughs> uh-huh. Yeah, it's like uh it's just it's like a horror movie for the English language that you kind of have to just like embrace. It's like a David Cronenberg horror movie for the English language and you just kind of have to embrace it and just be like, yeah, this is a thing. You know, yeah. it's maybe it's not like, your cup of tea, but it's it's art. <laughs> yeah. It, it, it is it is as it should be for middle America at the very least. And mm-hmm. uh, def- definitely made my my uh, youth like, you know, the the living embodiment of video drum, as it were. <laughs> yeah. So it seems to me like your musical journey is is uh, very kind of like not reminiscent of a David Cronenberg film because it's actually <laughs> far more beautiful than that. <laughs> uh, but but it it is it is very uh, transformative like a Cronenberg yeah. film because like you start out with something like the gadgets and, and, you know, go to the architects, other Americans, and then to the condition it's, you know, you and, start yeah. Out- and then, and then men's a death squad. And then I'm, yeah. Uh, and then I'm like somewhere here. Yeah. What, what I find uh, really fascinating is you could inhabit all of those spaces yet do it all very well. I mean, the gadgets were incredibly well, loved and every band thereafter i i feel was very well received and loved thank you i hope that's true i I think i think it is of everyone that i've ever uh listened to your music with or around or been in the orbit of have all had a resounding positive vibration for it my i guess my opening question for that would be though what is the uh what is the impetus what's the heartbeat of that i mean coming into your own as a a teenager i'm guessing uh being drawn to music what was that first that 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 first uh hit Uh, well i mean the the first hit that got me hooked was like so i come from a very artistic family um Mm -hmm. and uh so my mom was a, a theatrical director and producer and uh and i would one of my one of my most important creative memories is laying in my room, listening to her downstairs coaching drama students. Like kids would come to her for coaching for their college auditions and things like that. And um, so 
like I didn't have any idea what she was doing, but I was aware that like, like this is work that's being done and it's important. You know, like this is important work, even though I don't really grasp what's happening. Yeah. And, um, and so I, you know, kind of fell in with her and her click, you know, and, uh, performing arts just became like the hit. Yeah. And, and then I found a way to playing, playing music with my brothers. And it was like, that was the best possible hit for me. Um, and, you know, and I think a lot of that, uh, I don't know the 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 journey it's funny because the journey does start too young mm -hmm. um like looking back on it i'm like yeah i i turned pro way too young right yeah. like i was not ready for that it was not ready for me there was nobody who was equipped to like hold my hand in the way that i needed my hand held um uh but the funny part for me is that like, I look back on all of those gadgets records and it, there's this very clear, like gadgets records through the first couple of architects records. There's this very clear arc of, oh, yeah. um, trying to figure out who the, you know, who the hell I am. Like I can hear me trying to figure out who the hell I am. And I hear, I can hear the bands always, you know, the, the bands were always, always a work in progress. Like we never had, walls it was always fluid in terms of like we do what we want yeah and that was like a really like defiant attitude that we had about the scenes and genres and stuff like that and so i think uh you know like all that the kind of i don't look down on it but that all those transformations, the very young ones, that, that very young person's journey of like, who am I? Am I my record collection or am I something else? Am I, am I, am I my record collection or am I trying to go in the direction that my record collection points me? Like, I don't know. And, uh, and I remember that. I remember that time really distinctly and kind of fondly. But um, like, that's all really clear to me back then. And then when you pick up with like mid to late architects records through uh you know maybe through the first other americans record i didn't really write all that much i wrote a few things on other americans but i didn't write songs all that much but um uh it's a different kind of confusion it goes from being like teenage confusion to being uh sorry there's a hummingbird drinking from my jasmine and it's really cute okay oh, that's um, awesome. <laughs> So it goes from being that kind of like teenage, young adult confusion to like a different, more desperate kind of confusion. And that I will lay squarely at the doorstep of I started too young. And so some stuff got kind of frozen in amber. And, you know, by the time I hit my, you know, hit my mid twenties, thirties, I'm, you know, kind of like, this doesn't fit. Everything feels really wrong sized here. Like, um, you know, and so it was a really it, like the transformation that was going on then feels a lot more, um, uh, feels darker. It feels a little bit, a, a lot more, conf a, a lot more conflicted. It's not just that innocent naivete of you. It's like, there's like some real adult conflict there, like, you know, and that's that sense of the, like, it's not real, but everybody feels that mid twenties, like gun to the back of your head to like, get your shit together, whatever that means. Yeah. Um, <laughs> like, yeah. And I'm sure that was, you know, I'm sure that was at play. Do you think that stunted you or do you think it actually sort of hardened you to something existentially? Because it could um, sort of do both, really, if yeah. you think about it. It probably can. I I would say it hardened me to something existentially. But then when we finally put the architects on pause and 
I kind of cleared away some space to do Men's of Death Squad, and it was just going to be me, and I wasn't going to, I wasn't going to have any bandmates. I wasn't going to have anybody else to bounce ideas off of or anything like that. Um, and when I got to that place and started making Men's of Death Squad records, it occurred to me that doing this by myself was the most cathartic therapeutic healing thing that I could possibly do. And I started kind of unpacking my artistic past and realizing how, how fucked up it had been. <laughs> and, uh, you know, and how I, you know, fucked myself up and my bandmates and how we'd all kind of fucked each other up. And, you know, and cause it, like a band is, is hard on your best day, but a band with your two brothers, um, is a whole different, uh, kettle of fish. <laughs> yes. So because like, the, like nobody could, no one can hurt your feelings like your family. Uh, yeah, nobody. Yeah. No one will dig their heels in and fight you like your family will yeah. like, holy shit. And you know, if a bandmate that you're not related to gets strung out, that's a certain, you can adopt any number of different attitudes about that. If you're, if a bandmate that's your younger brother gets strung out, you only your, your choices are limited in how you're going to handle this like yeah you know especially if you're not if you're not yourself the healthiest person in the world with like awesome boundaries which right. i wasn't right you know, you know <laughs> preaching to the choir i know all about it yeah, and the, sure. the fact is is like when you're not i was in not in a band with my uh youngest brother but we were definitely unhealthy together for a good amount of time. And I, uh, mm. when I decided to get clean, uh, there was the question of, do I not deal with this person anymore? And is it, since he's so much younger than me, is it my fault that he turned out this way? It turned out I, it wasn't my fault, but I, I was still his older brother. I should have been a better everything to him, but you know, in the confines of a, of a band situation where, being on the road, being surrounded by the type of people you're going to be surrounded by when you're on tour. Yeah. You know, shit happens. It's, it's, it's and never the healthiest venue for self care. No. And that, you know, to, to be in a band on tour, like you're part of a very tightly scripted world. Yeah. The expectations of you are very tightly scripted. People have, a set list of things if they want to make you happy or say something cool that you want to hear there is a short list of things and they will just be repeated from city to city mm -hmm. you know and that list of things can include you know you're really hot or do you want some coke yeah and you know and you know like you it took me till like year six to figure out that like other people's problems with uh with addiction or codependency or whatever weren't on me that wasn't for me to you know, but when I was doing the band, like, I, I mean, I was caretaking as many derelicts as we could put in the van. I was caretaking all of them. And mm -hmm. then we'd, you know, we'd come home and I would go off and become the derelict while we were at home because I couldn't get away with it on tour. But at home, I don't have the same obligations. And so I would just binge the fuck out on, you know, yeah. on whatever. And it was not pretty do you think that's why even though like you know throughout the gadgets and architects there was there were darker songs yes but yeah mensa death squad is the darkest thing you've ever done hands down musically like by a mile yeah is this like the your final like exorcism and and purging of all of this information and and poison that you, you kind of laid yourself at the feet of for so long I always wanted to do something like this because I, you know, I like it dark. Yeah. Um, like it's a lot of my, a lot of my most favorite music just veers that direction. Mm -hmm. um, and so I always wanted to do something like that, but like gadgets and the architects weren't really the right place for it. Um, um, yeah, it was kind of the wrong size for, for what I wanted to do. Um, and, I don't know if, you know, if MDS ends up just sort of being like a big purge of bad feelings or if it's like 
this is how I figure out how to be comfortable in this place, you know, because I'm not one of those clean people who's desperate to see the sun every day. Yeah. You know, like I get it. It's a dark world. It's hard and it has to be okay to just sit in that sometimes and just be like, well, it's, I'm not trying to dwell here, but here I am. Right. Yeah. Um, which kind of flies in the face of some NA stuff, but like it's, it just makes more sense to me to like reconcile that Like, uh, yeah, I live in a really imperfect, but really complicated world. And so, um, it, you know, my emotional sobriety is about kind of being at Zen with like, this is the imperfect, complicated world. I guess. I don't know. Well, no. And to me, it makes perfect sense because music art uh, at large does not have to follow the strictures of the big book. That's, yeah. that's just what we do at meetings. And, you know, <laughs> yeah, right. and, and so far as that, as long as I'm doing my part to be healthy toward myself in that arena, the art that I create does not have to be this fucking big ray of sunshine for everyone to bask in. This is my, this is my place. Yeah. To, you know, kind of channel the good, bad and indifferent that I, I choose to put out there into the ether. I think yeah. it does. I think Mensa death squad does it very well for you. That's why I don't, I don't perceive it as an emotional dumping ground, but more like a, a letting off the head pressure. Just like it, yeah. get, okay, let it build again, you know, and that's what great art really truly is. It's, it's existential crisis and existential crisis, uh, averting. Well, what I thank you. First of all, what I want very much for, for MDS is for me to take advantage of is like, you know, part of my, you know, a lot of my artistic process kind of got fucked up by being in a, by being in a band with basically the same people for 20 plus years. Yeah. Um, and you can't really help it. And it's certainly not their fault. And I'm not mad at anybody about it, but it's like you start writing for other people's tastes because you know what somebody else is going to say about your weirdly obtuse lyric. Yeah. You know, but I don't get that. You know, you already know it's coming. And so you change the lyric, you know, you start self editing and you get the voices of your, of your collaborators in your head. And you do that for long enough and it's exhausting and you don't want to do it anymore. And what you want to do, like you start, it starts feeling like you're compromised before you even come out of the gate. Um, and so what I wanted to do was just like, just tear myself open and let, you know, let something beautiful come out, let something awful come out, whatever, you know, whatever it is, I just want it to come out so that I can figure out how to make art again by myself and in a way that where like it feels like it's supposed to, right? Because by the end, by the last few, you know, years and months of, uh, uh, of architects writing, I was just so exhausted. I was so tired of playing that character and writing for that character. It felt like a character. It felt like a job, yep. you know, it felt like I'd been, I was in like, I'm acting in season 26 of the show that I'm <laughs> tired of. Like, you know, it was like season 26 of, you know, uh, uh, you know, four and a half men. It's like, Oh God. <laughs> <laughs> like these jokes suck. Like, you know, no one I believes the premise that. anymore. Yeah. yeah. I already know what you're going to say. Like, mm -hmm. <laughs> I, I, Thankfully, I I'd never been in a position in a band with siblings. I, I have to say because <laughs> I, I can only imagine that right now our relationships would be so irreparably fractured because, and not because of them, because of me, because I know what uh, the depths of my own depravity uh, <laughs> I'm capable of and how dark I can become. Yeah, Pe people I've played in bands with, I'm surprised still like me, uh, and thankfully they do. But. Fuck, man. Well, on, you see everything. You see every, every like side of the elephant. You know, it's yeah. It's a kind of intimacy that is so hard. 
like it, it's so hard to have that kind of intimacy and also have boundaries and strike some kind of balance because like you know one of the things that drives me craziest about about like sober living uh is that there's all these people that i'm supposed to be able to turn to right as like you know home group and then whatever and the whoever and the, you know, like all these people that i'm supposed to turn to and i know that if there are if there are 20 of them, the 19 of them will hotline me for saying what's on my mind. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. <laughs> and so I don't, and you know, and you sort of end up in that same place with a band and you, you just kind of want to be by yourself and just like, just like, okay, let me say the thing that would get me hotlined in any other context, because this is just me and it's mine and nobody can, you know, and, and honestly that was like, I, I worked with, uh, with Barb Morrison on this last Mensa Death Squad record. Um, uh, Barb came in and was like my mentor for that entire record. And uh, they were so awesome about creating the safe, the safe space where nobody's going to hotline you. Like, that's just like a completely judgment free bubble of nurturing or, or whatever like <laughs> before barb i had like i had to do all this like mental gymnastics to be able to like get the truth out right wow that's exhausting oh totally i mean the, the, like i i know people uh like myself who came through 12 steps and and it can it, it can be very beneficial and is beneficial to a degree, but there's a lot of pratfalls built into that, that kind of, Oh yeah. I understand. I don't know. I only know a few people who are in smart recovery and smart recovery doesn't buy into the precepts that we do. And I kind of understand now why they chose that path and why it works for them because it, it gets so fucking judgy and yeah. like, People are like calling you out on your shit when there's nothing to be called out on. And it's, Oh God, it's so tiresome. Yeah. I wound up, I wound up being a refuge recovery guy. Um, simply because I never, you know, and like, I just kind of bounce around to the online meetings with refuge, right? Yeah. Go to one, go to one from one city, go to another with another city. It doesn't, there's not a refuge group in my town. So, yeah. um, but like, uh, what I don't ever hear is the kind of like the angry guy who thinks he, who thinks staying clean is a matter of his own toughness and who says shit like we're all a bunch of piece of shit junkies and drunks. And I'm like, no, I am not mm -mm. like, I'm fine. If somebody says, why don't I drink? I'll say, because I'm a drug addict. Yeah. You know, because I understand that that's not going away but I'm not kicking my own ass about it anymore. Like yeah. I did what I had to do. I'm doing what I have to do every day. Like I don't, I don't want to eat all this huge plate of shame. Yeah. Like I'm not ashamed of being recovered. Like I did some horrendous shit for sure. But like, that was part of my work was cleaning the mess up. And once the mess is cleaned up, and that, you know, and the other thing is like, every time I hear that, that guy, the kind of like angry guy who's like, you know, just keeping it all inside. And it, like, I listen to that share and that share happens like five times a night, especially yeah. if you're in the Midwest, I think, um, you listen to that share and you're like, dude, you don't stay sober through toughness. You stay sober by getting softer. Yeah. Like you're, you'll never be tougher than cocaine, man. No, it's the toughest. It's undefeated. Yep. Like, <laughs> drugs are undefeated. Like, I, I have to say, like, you know, I, I, I was, I was in a, in a love affair with the combination of cocaine and heroin for a long time because one without the other didn't quite work for me as much as I wanted it to. <laughs> so I had to have both. And I can tell you with a great amount of certainty that that motherfucker is undefeated undefeated you i'm can't. not strong i'm not stronger than it i'm i am in recognition of the fact that i'm weaker than it yeah real easy yeah and the only way 
like you don't beat it. You just become like water. Yep. And let it exist, and you exist in your own way. Yep. Like that's it. And everything, the, all the stuff that you need to make that work and to make that feel good every day is not tough stuff. It's soft stuff. Yeah. It's tenderness and compassion and kindness and like, you know, all this shit that sounds really woo woo to like the the big book tough guys or whatever. <laughs> like, yeah. Yeah. You know, what and can they're I out do? there. Yeah. They're totally out there. And, you know, like, well, you know, what can I do? Sit there and wait for my turn. But the thing is, is like, that's <laughs> like, it's so Catholic. It's oh, so oh, yeah. Catholic. Just the, the lashing. Of, the self-flagellation of Catholicism. Just put on my yeah. hair shirt and hit me. And like, no, come on, man. Yeah. You got to get Eastern at some point. You go with the Beatles out to India and, and, and find something else because my God, man. <laughs> yeah. Like. Yeah, that's it, that's the. It's like I get why it doesn't work for so many people. You know why it takes them fifteen years to get sixty days because, it's yeah. like, you know, it's so easy to pick it apart. And you don't like who wants to eat a big bowl of shame every day, three times a day, ninety and ninety. Like, who wants? You know, God, I don't. I know somebody right now who didn't even slip, but that they, they felt weak. So now they're doing a ninety and ninety. For feeling weak mm -hmm. and it's like more power to you that's wonderful if that's if that's a uh, uh, beneficial to you i'm never doing it again but i'm, yeah. not, I'm never going to put myself in a position where i have to again so i i'm going to put myself in a position where i what i want is so totally different yeah that it just doesn't make any sense like there's just no sense in go in going back you know going backwards you know and that's you know, and that makes, you know, to full circle it, like, that's where, it, that's where I end up falling on all these, you know, on questions of like gadgets reunions or whatever. I'm like, there's no sense in going backwards. I can't, I don't like to, no fun. No, like, it's, it's not worth it. Yeah. That's like art has to go forward. It just can't. It implodes like, otherwise. Yeah. And that, that, that implosion is the pressure of everything that you kind of got past, you know, it's like getting the bends by going deeper into the ocean. Mm -hmm. uh, get me to the surface already. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. And I, I think, I think it's beneficial for people to hear, but I also think that there's a point where you've just got to like forgive yourself and, 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 and like, move on, move the fuck on, you know? Yeah. And I, I'm constantly, because, you know, I, I interview musicians, I, and nine out of 10 are in recovery legitimately, like <laughs> with, without fail, nine out of 10 are in recovery of some kind. Uh, I think you're the first, you're the first one in recovery that uh, isn't fully bought into the, you know, scripture and the, and the rigor of 12 steps with the exception of my friend, John from the band Catholic school, because he's in smart recovery. He doesn't even believe in that stuff. Right. <laughs> it's so easy. I just don't buy it. That's, that's it's beautiful. I mean, so, some people like more rules, you know, like they just, they like more structure. They like more. You know, and I'm, fine with that I, I you know that that doesn't strike me as being wrong but uh you know but i just i just do believe that there's a way to do this without um without kicking your own ass over it you know all the time you know like i just i know people who have like 16 17 18 years and they still talk about themselves as though you know they smoked their last rock the other day yeah you're like you're not that anymore man like when are you gonna let yourself be who you are now like it's the hair shirt that's the hair shirt man that they're still wearing it yeah like be who you are right now you don't have to keep apologizing for who you were then i don't want the apology and very few i mean it it's amazing <laughs> that how few people actually want an apology 
they're just like, oh man, whatever. I don't like, just like, if you feel better saying it, say it, but I don't really give a shit. Yeah. You know, or like I, I, and you're like, really? Wow. This was supposed to be a big deal. Yeah. The, these, <laughs> this amends was supposed to really be a breakthrough. I guess it's just whatever. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> On to the next, uh, amends, I guess. Yeah, either that or they're still angry and they're like, are you done? Okay. Thanks. Yeah. And <laughs> I, I hope cool. I never see you again, and that's it. Cool. And that, that's okay, too. Yeah, I mean, you know, <laughs> I burn people, for sure. And They're allowed to be mad. Yep. It's usually family, too. I mean, family or, or uh, love interest. I mean, <laughs> yeah. most friends are, are, if they're really your friends, are pretty cool about all of that stuff, unless you really ripped them. But, you know. Yeah. At the end of the day, I I don't think I ever really lost anyone to that process. Um, the only people I lost were people that were so much deeper into their shit that I couldn't really be around them and be safe myself. <laughs> yeah, it's kind of about it. But that being said, I think the flavor of Mensa Death Squad is also not like mired in. Uh, like the, the the self-flagellation or the, the the depression that comes from you know working your way out of something like that it's dark but it's dark in, a, in an esoteric and existential way that i think can appeal to just about anyone who's ever felt bad about any damn thing and i think that's important uh because your lyrics are, are not obtuse but they can definitely be taken in a, a few different ways that lend themselves to it you know to uh a more universal appeal if that makes sense yeah thank you i i if you understand what i'm saying that like you know you're not like hammering down this point like this happened then this guy died and then this and now my life is fucked <laughs> like none of, that's not it. that story's not in there you know what i mean yeah i think yeah. going going into it you were coming from a more pure place than that it's yeah. I mean, I just, it's like, I don't necessarily feel like I have to tell like some gritty noir story about my, my getting clean. Yeah. Right. Because my getting clean was, it's just, it is what it is. I'm not like trying to hide it or anything like that, but it actually doesn't really make a very good song. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> you know, but like all the, all the, the, steps along the way all the growth that's happening all the dragons that have had to been that need to be slayed to go from then to now like that's that actually is pretty interesting to me like that's that feels like fodder for a song that feels like art um you know because it you know cleaning yourself up will really really change the way that you uh the, the way that you view other people and relationships and attitudes and you know whatever and that's like like that is inc like healing yourself is incredibly helpful to art mm -hmm. and so even if you're not writing about the healing journey necessarily which i don't i don't think i'm writing about that not most of the time but um you know i there's this like, I don't know. I've I wrote an article about this once about how much just because it pissed me off so much that there's this like cliche about like the suffering artist and um, you know, and like I have I'm pretty seriously neurodivergent <laughs> in addition to being a recovering addict, um, and it really bums me out the way that uh, the neurodivergence and addiction sort of get pornographied when it comes to musicians. It's like like that's the that's the garter and stockings that we have to wear mm -hmm. you know in order for people to buy the record or whatever and you're just like oh god we really like you really find this sexy yeah because it it's not yeah it's, it's like the, the antithesis thereof actually yeah it's, it's not sexy it really sucks <laughs> you know um, like it it really sucks and it's really uh it really breaks my heart every time somebody puts out another posthumous Amy Winehouse documentary. Cause I'm just like, would you stop monetizing this poor girl's suffering? Yeah. Yeah. Like, 
I mean, because if you want to monetize suffering, you can come to my home group or the uh, my alternate group, you know, and there are five of her in every one of those. Groups. They're just not famous singers. Yeah. And so you can get all the suffering you want. You know, I mean, from someone who made it out nonetheless. Yeah, it's just, yeah. So it just breaks my heart. I get really defiant about it because, uh, uh, you know, because I'm like, this isn't, this isn't what you want for good art. Good art doesn't come from suffering. Good art doesn't come from crazy. You know, it doesn't come from neurodivergence. It doesn't come from, uh, you know, I hate that old Bill Hicks line about, you know, musicians had to be fucked up to, to make incredible music. I was like, no, they fucking didn't. Like, no, they, they were making it despite all of that shit, despite it, not, not because of it. Yeah. It's like, you know, heroin and cocaine had nothing to do with Bill Evans being the most poetic jazz piano player, in, yeah. you know, in my collection. It had nothing to do with it. Like, you get him off heroin, and he's still Bill Evans. You put yeah. him on, you take him from heroin to cocaine, and he's still Bill Evans. You know, so, like, I don't know, that stuff. Yeah, I, I get really, like, bent out of shape about that stuff because it's just so, like, it's just such a tired fucking trope. Well, everyone, like, what are you they, gonna do? Yeah, everyone thinks of the rock star. They think of Jimi Hendrix, Jim Morrison, uh, Kurt Cobain, yeah. uh, Sid Vicious, and and like these people were. They, they they well, with the exception of Sid Vicious, the rest of them made glaring contributions to the diaspora of music. But yeah. they did they did it despite mental health issues and and addiction yeah. issues, like not because of them, because they. they this was, that was inherent to them. They were born with that. Yeah. You can, you can make really interesting art because you're neurodivergent and your perspective is just a little bit different. Mm. That perspective can help your art for sure. But like, that's not the same thing as like suffering. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. You know, I mean, Hieronymus Bosch was more than likely neurodivergent. Yeah. But brilliant. William yeah. Blake, William Blake, brilliant, but brilliant. De definitely broken. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. But, you know, heroin didn't even exist when these people were creating, you know, that this was a, this, this was a natural thing. It was a natural state of being a fugue state. Wonderful. Yeah. I'm like, I just, I have a hard time believing that Edgar Allan Poe would have been any less amazing if he weren't. Oh, he got worse. I mean, yeah. Take he away got, the. He got like mm -hmm. like shades worse. Um, I, I wish I could think of the example that I was just about to bring up of Poe towards the end when he was really like. Oh yeah, like the later work that was just not. It just didn't just, match up. Yeah, and that's because he was addicted to alcohol and laudanum and everything else he was he was sticking into his body mm -hmm. same th like jim jim morrison toward the end is the same Oof, yeah you know that american prayer album or whatever like yikes hi hippies the world over like oh he's such a poet no he's hammered yeah he's hammered <laughs> he was a reasonable writer but he was just yeah it didn't get better. No, I, I, I can think of, I can think of like, my dad was a huge doors fan. Um, the doors did kind of start me in a lot of ways, but in a lot of ways I had outgrown them by the time I was 15. Mm -hmm. And I know that's terrible to say, but with the exception of uh, the end and that lizard King poem that came inside of uh, the first record, nothing else really moved me quite so much right you know it just it's it's a cool place to start but you start yeah. there then you get iggy pop and then it starts to really become something you know yeah i like raymond zarek a lot i thought he was a really uh a, like he's a really fascinating player you know i thought that was really cool yeah but, no. uh his um, his involvement in with X and everything like that was really cool too. I mean, like super he, cool. Yeah. Arguably the actual visionary of that band. 
Yeah. Yeah, I'd agree with that. But like they're it, everybody's trying to they're all stealing from jazz anyway and blues. Yeah. Like they're stealing from Howl, Howl and Wolf, they're stealing from uh Coltrane, they're stealing from Bill Evans, like like it's all <laughs> been done. It's all been done and it's all been done. Yep. I think when things got really interesting again is right around 69 70 71 when you get the mc5 and the stooges and then music in my opinion becomes relevant again in a very palpable way yeah it becomes um, reconnected to ground level yeah i think that's what you like when the architects like the gadgets were phenomenal but architects is when you started to i think celebrate that era of music yes um, very and much. You, you embraced that in, in a very gut level way because it did. It reminded me very much of the stuff that happened in Detroit, but also some of the stuff that happened with the better parts of the British movement with the damned and the clash, you know, who yep. arguably were the best out of that whole school. Uh, that's the way I feel anyway. But, you know, yeah, we were big clash fans. And um, and it, there was a lot of uh, like I still to this day use the Clash as justification for whatever sort of like whims and larks I want to go on artistically because I'm just like it, Strummer would do it, Strummer would say do it, so I'm going I'm doing it. Well, you know? kind of, like Strummer kind of did do all of that, you know. Yeah. He didn't. You didn't do what he'd done. You did your own thing, and and that's evident. But. Would he have been on board yeah. for it? I think is the real question, and the real answer is absolutely, yeah. absolutely, yeah. he would have been. He's yeah. he's kind of the father of all of our uh, collective whims in a way because he was everything that everyone blamed Jim Morrison for being. Joe Strummer <laughs> actually was. Yeah, Strummer actually okay. he actually was a poet. He actually did live a deliberate life yes he did that, i think that's i think that's 100 percent accurate because um, he, he grew up he was the son of uh his, his dad was an emissary uh to some country i forget which yeah at that moment but he just pulled the plug on all of that and became a squatter okay. and lived on the dole in london uh and was in a phenomenal pub rock band and the 101ers yeah the 101ers and you know he was he was the embodiment of the spirit that all of these other bands were were uh espousing to be before he was involved in that scene and once he got involved in it he was he out punked all of them <laughs> yeah it was very intentionally bohemian mm -hmm. you know and you kind of got the sense that like uh I don't know. It was he. Strummer seems very intentional, and uh, uh, Morrison seems very pretension, like be pretensional. If that's that's not a word, but it, he seems a bit. It's a bit more like. Uh, uh, I don't know, like a trust fund kid spending their inheritance or something. But, well, he he basically was because he was in film school, right? Yeah hanging out with Francis Ford Coppola yeah. and tripping. And I mean, I, with the exception of the trust fund, I did all that kind of stuff too. Um, but you know, th there's, there's a point where the role you're playing, like you're not howling wolf and we all know it. You're a, yeah. a, a rich upper middle class, Ir Irish Catholic white kid. Yeah, right. and the one that the truth kind of came out with him that it was just sort of drunken buffoonery. Yeah. You know, like when you saw, you know, when you see all like the Miami incidents and all those kind of like all that goofball nonsense that he pulled, you know, you just sort of see a drunken, a drunken kid just being, a, just being a dumbass. So. If he were ugly, none of this happens because the, the way he got into the whole band was he was yeah he, I, I never got the sense that he was 
I never got the sense of anything other than he was very pretty and he could ape a blues voice pretty well for a white kid. Because they used to hand him a guitar that wasn't plugged in and stick him on the side of the stage because the chicks dug Jim. That's the beginning of that band. <laughs> <laughs> oh, if that were only my problem yeah. back in the day. And yeah, I mean, yeah, and Iggy, Iggy and Strummer were definitely more of the real. McCoy. Well, yeah, because Iggy Pop grew up in a trailer right with like six or seven brothers and sisters that he shared a bedroom with and you know he he lived that that blue collar that 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 smut on your nose figure every every man mm -hmm. that people like Jim Morrison kind of tried to be i uh, that's why i give a lot of credit to somebody like Jimi Hendrix because at the very least he was a Vietnam veteran and he was a, a, an army ranger. You know? <laughs> at, yeah. le at least he knew what it was and yeah. knew what it was to be a black man in the United States of America during Jim Crow. Yeah. And he was a really well seasoned musician before he ever went solo. Yeah. And so, and like that's, you know, that's a pretty important part of the story. The if you're a musician. Yeah. yeah. And, yeah. uh, what was the other one? Little Richard? Yeah, Little Richard. Yeah. Absolutely. Who is, uh, in my humble opinion, the true king of rock and roll. But that's just oh. that's just me. I'm with you. Between him and Chuck Berry, I, it's a close it's a close run. But Chuck Berry did some really gnarly stuff. So I, I'm going to give it to Little Richard just based on that. <laughs> yeah, it's hard to... It's hard to be his champion. It is. It is. For, for as for as like unimpeachable as some of his music is, yeah, that's it's it's kind of hard to be his champion. Yeah. But I think all of this really does make sense in the greater story of your music because all of these influences to me are very apparent. Oh, good. They 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 uh without without wearing it on its sleeve is a badge like this is what i'm into this is like you know the the gadgets i think were a great starting point for you because it didn't really it wasn't really like kind of anything in particular that was going on at the time i mean a lot of people were embracing the ska of it all but you guys kind of weren't really you were that but you weren't really that it was just an influence it was a seasoning yeah it, it was a flavor yeah, that's the the main gadgets regret that I have is that we had so much going on that I I wish that there had been somebody there to help us sort it out, like some older, wiser mentor to go, Oh, okay, I see like I like I see you and all this weird stuff that you're listening to and why it feels important that you get all this stuff on the record. Mm -hmm. right all this stuff needs to go in every song and that was how, kind of how we did it. it was like okay well how do we get you know how do we get these 60 soul records on the you know <laughs> into what we're doing and then how do we get all this costello in there and then how do we you know and uh you know and if there had been somebody uh, like i maybe it's just like my imagination maybe this is my version of nostalgia is like i wish that there had been somebody to kind of hold our hand and be like okay this is how you do what you what it is you want to do like this is the okay you know someone just to say it's okay to do it this way because i feel like we probably would have made um like we probably would have made really cool records and we would have been at least a little bit more satisfied with ourselves there was, that was always kind of elusive like we thought you know it's like we thought we were doing okay but we just couldn't break the membrane of great you know <laughs> like yeah, we just couldn't punch through that i always thought that you guys had had that in just predicated on the fact that you were on the label you were on and kind of like a contemporary of and surrounded by the luminaries of said label that you maybe would have had somebody kind of helping you out more than you got helped. I, I guess I, in a way I find that strange that no one did, but in a way it also kind of makes sense because. I mean, I don't want to make it sound like we were completely abandoned because we weren't. 
there were people that that you know would would try to point us in one direction or another or you know say what is it you really want um you know but it i don't know it never really felt like it connected fully um you know like i don't want to I wouldn't say that we were completely on our own. At at one point, we found ourselves completely on our own, and it was like, "Oh my God, what do we do?" Yeah. But um, but being in that company was terrifying for me because I was like, "I'm not this good." Like we went out on tour with Hepcat and the Slackers, and like you watch Greg and Alex get up on stage every night, and you're like, "Is it even possible for me to be that good?" Like if I you know, it, like if I go to Juilliard for the next 25 years and just work as hard as a, <laughs> like, what do you do to get that good? Like, how hard do you practice? What do you practice? And it really, I mean, it totally spun me out because I have, uh, like, I have an obsessive disorder. And so, like, I would just go in endless circles about, like, how and what and how do I get better and, you know, how much better what's you know how where do i set the bar and it just it, it just absolutely cooked my brain for like years see the thing is like it, it seemed to me like you weren't trying to achieve the same kind of thing that hepcat or the slackers were doing anyway because yeah. because of the attractions of it all you know yeah when you mentioned to anybody like in our age group and older and you say Elvis Costello and the attractions, they, they're they not going to call them a ska band. No. Ska's an influence. Yep. Most of them wouldn't even call them a punk band. I'm one of the few that would. Most of them would be like, oh, yeah, they're a new wave band. <laughs> yeah. Right? Something. It's it kind of a nice argument. umbrella to be under because you get to... It'd be an argument, but they're both nice umbrellas to be under because you don't have to be married to just, you know... Up, like, like up picking on a guitar and pick it up, pick it up. Yeah. Dit, dit, dit. Yeah. As much as I liked all the other bands you toured with and mentioned, that's never what I'd gleaned from you guys as, as a, as a, at the fore of, of the, the oeuvre, you know what I'm saying? Sure. Yeah. Yeah. Kinda. I just know that they, they set the bar very high. Like we, like, we were we were hyper aware that the bar was really high, especially on that tour and a few other tours that we did with those bands. It was just like, man, they are they are really really great, and you know, we're just not that we're just not there. And it was it like that that tore me up. My God! But how much younger were you than those bands at that point? Oh, so much younger. Right. I mean, yeah. So much younger. Adam was like 13 years old when I went out on tour with Hepcat. Mm -hmm. Like, you know, there's no reason to, for a 13 year old to be worrying about whether or not he's as good as the 35 year old drummer that he's on tour with. And yet, here, here we are in this situation. And it's kind of a miracle that Adam didn't get his brain baked the <laughs> same way that I did. <laughs> because. <laughs> I mean, at the end of the day, though, uh, it kind of seems like once you, once you landed on the architects, it it, it seemed like it, it became something more manageable. Yeah. Well, we tried to set some parameters for a change because, like, we felt like the gadgets sprawled in too many different directions. And so when we cut loose of that name, and because that's really all we did was we cut loose of the name and renamed ourselves uh it was just about like okay let's get rid of all this baggage and just be a rock band mm -hmm. and see what happens because i think we'll be good at it <laughs> and that was the idea at least and uh and it's funny because you know the architects also ended up sprawling in all kinds of <laughs> other ways and in order to deal with that sprawl, we started other Americans and, and uh, the condition because we needed, it's like, okay, let's keep all the Elvis Costello stuff in the condition and let's keep all of this, uh, you know, all of this really like dancey, funky, uh, trip hoppy 
electronic stuff. Let's keep that over here in other Americans. You know, just have a place where we can go pretend to be massive attack or whatever. Yeah. And then, uh, you know, and like, so let's create some lanes here. And, uh, and that kind of worked, you know, that it was at least helpful. Maybe it's just me that I need some structure. I don't know. I, well, I think in, in order to have, uh, an entity, uh, even though like largely you guys were all the same people yeah. in order to have an entity to, to, to like create some kind of, uh, of a, like a lane, as you'd said, it makes it easier for you to swallow. But I think, you know, going back to how the gadgets were really kind of going here, there and everywhere. I think that was fun for a lot more people than you realize. I, I mean, we had a blast doing it, but we also ended up with a bunch of people in our ear telling us that it was a, that it was a bad idea that we were going to confuse people. And, uh, you know, that, uh, and it was basically like, we just got, we sort of got filled up on a bunch of marketing jargon. Yeah. You know, I think pe uh, people started saying things like, well, I mean, I don't even understand. It's like, I feel like you guys should be marketed like a jam band or something. And we were like horrified at that <laughs> prospect. Like, I mean, that, that was the most, that was the worst thing we'd ever heard was like you would lay us side by side with widespread panic what are you a monster yeah, like are you serious like, god yeah i uh that that doesn't even compute i think yeah maybe. i think the listening public is a lot smarter than marketing geniuses realize oh yeah yeah completely but you know we were young we got rolled <laughs> that and that and that's how it goes that's how it goes yeah. and and it, it might have been a story of uh too much too soon maybe oh yes like, definitely like you'd said in the beginning like it, it kind of wasn't a slow build at all and for someone who obsesses like yourself and I, I can only glean confusion and horror from that <laughs> you know <laughs> Hang on one second. I'm sorry. Yep. Uh, spirit. Thank you. Sorry. Hey, listen, you're, you're like in an Uber right now trying to get to an airport and then you're going to get on a plane. I don't even know how you're holding this together right now because I'd be like, I'm, uh, eh. I'm one of those, I can't multitask. It's very difficult for me. I'm, fr I'm a very, very frail male in that manner. I have to <laughs> I have to zone in on something and just latch on to it because if something else catches my eye, I'm like, I'm like a raccoon. Ooh, something shiny and it's over. I'm, I'm fucked. <laughs> I, I prefer being totally sentimental things, but, uh, if I can, if I can accomplish this, you know, like state of Zen where it's like, no, I have to do three things at once and it's not forever. It's just for now. <laughs> there's this whole like dialogue that has to happen in my head to be able to do to be able to multitask like uh <laughs> like to be able to do my job job and then i'll at the same time do music stuff and film stuff and whatever other stuff i'm trying to do like i have to have this like constant dialogue in my head it's like it's okay to put this down for a minute and go do the other thing that you need to do and then you can come back to it and like Ugh. <laughs> is your job job at least adjacent to entertainment um in the loosest possible definition it's <laughs> i i mostly i just try to mostly i i produce instructional content mm -hmm. right so like if you know i'll produce like osha training for nurses or i'll produce um uh you know site supervisor training for the new york city department of buildings or so I like that. I'm probably familiar with stuff you've done because I've been in the plumbing field for almost 28 years. You may well have taken an OSHA course I, that I've yeah. I've taken I well the longest one I had taken is an OSHA 40. Well. Yeah. Yeah, I, I did the I did an NFPA 40 one time that was like this is the largest project I've ever looked at. It's bonkers. Oh, 
Oh. <laughs> yeah. I mean, 40 hours of fire protection. Like, yeah. Uh. So I, it's not really entertainment adjacent. Eh, I guess not, but I, I mean, I could see how you can uh, kind of sidestep into something like that and, and make it feel that way. Uh, you know, before this, I had done marketing and advertising work, and I just detested marketing and advertising. And I, and I didn't expect to like instructional design or instructional writing, but it turns out I love it because it feels really ethical. Yeah. It's like, this is a good way to earn your living is teach people how to not click on a phishing link or teach people how to, you know, uh, uh, you know, what to do in an active shooter situation or, you know, what, like just create the training courses that people need to take. And like teaching is very ethical. Whereas trying to sell people another chicken sandwich feels like I want to jump off a building, <laughs> you know, my first job out of college, I worked for an ad agency for approximately four and a half months doing tech writing for an ad agency. Uh uh, oh. And I was uh, doing tech writing for uh, franchisee manuals for this advertising agency that had Whoa. these backlit billboards that were on trucks that drove all over the place and just parked oh. places. Yeah, yeah, yeah. By the end of this four and a half months, I had applied for another job within the company to be their maintenance man. Took that and I've been zen happy ever since yeah. I'm, I'm the son of a pipe fitter i'm a plumber <laughs> i've known how to do this stuff since i was five years old it's second right. nature to me and at least the service i provide is is perfunctory it's basic but i'm never everyone's going to have to take a shower brush their teeth and poop and yeah and it's I'm, something that everybody needs needs not yeah not they need it the same way you know, they need it like they need the new blueberry chicken salad, blah, 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 from <laughs> Jack in the Box or whatever, like, which, I mean, to see, like, the amount of money that gets, and the other, the, the most frustrating thing about advertising, honestly, is the amount of money that gets spent, like, I could make four, like, I, I have at least four short films, like, screenplays, sitting on a hard drive that I can't afford to make, I could make all four of them for the cost of one stupid salad commercial, you know, like a fast food salad commercial, because there'll be 16 grown adults clustered around a light box. And we're just, we're, we're just doing beauty shots and misting a salad. And like, <laughs> I mean, and it's less like, I mean, it's like a Lady Gaga video or something, but it's a salad. I don't, I just don't care. And the dissonance is just so screaming loud in my head. Like, I can't, I don't want to be a part of this. Like a chicken sandwich, a salad. I had to be there while we, we had to fry, like fry and throw away like thousands of wings for wing for like a wings place commercial. And because under the lights, they start looking crappy after like four minutes. So you got to fry another batch off. And it was like, I can't be a part of this. It's so dumb. It's, it's like, so wasteful. <laughs> it's so, it's so wasteful, and it has all the pretense of art without being art. It's not really creative. It's fake creative. Like, oh, that must fake. be what it's like to be in the Backstreet Boys. Ah, oh, I mean, those guys at least have, like, they know why they're there. It's like sing and be pretty. Yeah. <laughs> you know, every single one of them knows, like, don't fall off, do some sit-ups, you know, and, you know, and keep up on your vocal exercises, sing and be pretty. That's their whole job. And that's like, at the end of the day, I can respect that, even though I'm like, Ugh, when it comes to the music, but I respect that it's like, that's a real line of work. <laughs> comparatively like, speaking you're absolutely right and i think my wife fell into the same dilemma because my wife is a filmmaker and 
now she now guess what she does she owns her own uh translation and interpretation firm tell me what that oh. has to do with film work nothing and she, when i tell you i have i have very good taste in film and my wife is very good at what she does and she hasn't done a thing with it in almost the entire time we've been together the last thing she did was a music video for my band and that was that like eight years ago uh, because there's no, there's no work out there. She worked on a film for Danny Aiello uh, in Scranton, Pennsylvania, where we're from, and that movie is like like detested fully across all boards because he'd taken like millions of dollars from the city and gave them a crappy film. But <laughs> it's so difficult to get uh, something of of artistic merit and value made. But if she wanted to make uh, a, a Baconator commercial, she'd be rolling in money right now. Yeah. Yeah. And it's, I mean, it's, it's awful, but that's the way it works. But it's like, you, you know, you go make Baconator commercials, you'll have the money to do your film. Yeah, I guess. You know, like, you know, I've, I've done a lot of chicken sandwich music. <laughs> and a lot of a lot of really compromised stuff that is you know paying for film stuff right now paying for music stuff uh, you know because eh, that's what you gotta do and it's either that or you spend the rest of your life uh, writing film grants which is depressing I can only imagine and I think we'd all be so much better off if we lived in like Norway or Sweden where they will actually like give you government yeah. grants just because you show up and apply for them and say, I'm a filmmaker. I want to make yeah. something and that they'll, they'll give it to you. Uh -huh. Where did we go wrong? <laughs> uh, we decided that everything was commodified and you have to be able to monetize every square inch of something or it's, you know, I mean, we don't see these things as art. We see them as uh, entertainment products. And, you know, and we, we've we just been racing to the bottom, to the, an even lower and lower common denominator for entertainment products. You know, and that's just sad, but it's just how it is. It's where we're at right now. And, like, I hasten to bring up... Uh, uh, you know, a, a scene from a, a film that all of the, uh, the, the, I, I don't even know what they call them, incels or whatever, love this movie. <laughs> uh, but in Fight Club, when he's talking about like, you know, the, all of the, the branding, owning like planets yeah. and stuff like that, you know, yeah. just because the, these people like that movie uh, doesn't mean Chuck Polonic isn't kind of a genius for writing it. Because he kind of is, oh, because yeah. he, he'd seen it coming, and yeah. it's it's yeah, it's, it's, it's really Orwellian. Right. Yeah, it's yeah. very Orwellian. Yeah, it's really great. Like the writing and everything, the, the premise, all of it, like it's unfortunate that it's been appropriated by assholes, but it's, yeah, you know, it is very good. It, it's it, it is a beautiful piece of art, and it's very prescient in these yes. uh, in these very very. Uh, almost snake plissken times where <laughs> you know, I, I, uh, I kind of feel like we're all going to be running around uh, behind the walls of our own prison cities at some point very soon. Probably. That seems <laughs> like a reasonable thing to be afraid of. There it is, folks. My discussion with Brandon Phillips and how he was able to really give well thought out and and intelligent answers to my questions while en route to the airport while you know getting in an uber and and you know worrying about all of that while still engaging in intelligent banter in this beautiful tete tete uh badminton scenario with me it's a testament to his intellect at the very least. This record is unstoppable. 
I can't wait for you all to hear it. So do yourselves a favor. Go over to Mensa Death Squad at Bandcamp. Pay the seven bucks for the record. And allow it to envelop you. It's a beautiful thing. He's making Dark Wave at such an elevated level that it blows my mind. He's got a film out right now entitled Men Like You, named for the song off of the previous album. Brandon's got so much going on. He's making techno music on the side. He's DJing. This is an unstoppable music machine. I hope you're loving this episode. I hope you're loving this music. I hope you go out and you pay money for this record. It's only $7. He's been Brandon. I've been Peter. You've been beautiful. And this has been The Book, a very, very bad things podcast. I love you all. Take care of each other. Go give your mom a hug and a kiss. Take care. Good night, everybody. Love the sun for